Okay, the last talk in this session is by another philosopher. Steve Peterson is at uh, Niagara University in New York. Steve's background is in, uh, is in epistemology. He's worked in a whole lot of, er of, of fields over the years. He's done some really interesting work on algorithmic metaphysics and algorithmic information theory as, the, as the, uh, the basis for a certain kind of metaphysics of the world. And in recent years, he's been increasingly turning to issues in the ethics of artificial intelligence with a number of um, important publications and things like the volume on robot ethics. But uh, his uh, talk for today is going to be very much, I think, engaging some of these issues about values and their connection to intelligence and, and goals. And the title is Superintelligence as Superethical. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so, so far you've heard from the guy who literally wrote the book on AI, Stuart Russell. And then you heard from Eliezer, whose institute seems to produce amazing results every couple weeks or so. And, uh, I mean, and also, the, I can attest, the Harry Potter fan fiction is pretty good. I'm about two-thirds of the way through. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And then we heard from the uh, team from the Future of Life Institute, who, uh, one of whom is a physicist who may have written the book of the universe, perhaps. And then finally, as, as Dave put it, uh, Wendell Wallach, uh, the one who wrote the, the classic book on ethics of AI. And now, finally, the moment has arrived, the moment you've been waiting for. Uh, you get to hear from the guy from the little liberal arts college outside Buffalo. <laughs> my, my wife says I'm a terrible self-promoter, and it's totally true. An, uh, uh, an, another way, I'm, uh, another self-deprecating thing I'll say is uh, Peter Railton said yesterday, uh, the slides of moral philosophers tend to look uninteresting. And uh, I guess today I'm a true moral philosopher. I, my background's in epistemology, but yeah, these slides won't have pictures, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and my talk is also like Peter's in that I too am gonna be pushing against what's been called the orthogonality thesis. So uh, let's take a look. First, we're gonna talk about the goals. What is it for a superintelligence to have goals? This has come up some already. Um, here's the problem in a nutshell, in case somehow you're just tuning into this or something just to see me. Um, the, 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 I, so this paper is a response in some ways to moderate some of the worries in Nick Bostrom's book. But as I hope it makes, I'm, I'll make clear, it's a very serious worry, and I'm glad there are people like Stuart and Eliezer and others working on it. But the problem is that, well, it seems like once we get genuine AI, assuming it's possible, it seems likely to bootstrap itself probably pretty quickly into a superintelligence, pr pretty probably one that'll have a strategic decisive advantage, so it doesn't need to cooperate with others and so on. And this is one way where... I think my proposal is a little different from, from Peter's, maybe. Uh, it tries to accommodate that possibility. Um, such superintelligence could wipe us out through mere indifference, as we've heard. Uh, they could have the bottom level goal of maximizing paperclips, just of different value from ours, not malice, but uh, as the comparison has gone, to with like ants. Uh, it's, we don't, as, as Max said and Stuart has said, we don't think twice about, uh, well, maybe twice, maybe once and a half about destroying an anthill, but. We don't let it, them get in our way, and we might be like that to the superintelligence. Um, so it could, it seems, have very different values from ours, like maximizing paper clips. As Eliezer was pointing out, it's easy to anthropomorphize here. It's easy to say nothing smart could care at bottom about paper clips, but it's easy to forget that you know we have our values from this weird evolutionary history. We like sugar, we like sex, we like these things because of how we've evolved, right? But these machine intelligences won't have any of that background shaping their values. They could have really alien, different values to ours. Um, so the key move in, in, this, in this worry, as, as Eliezer pointed out and is featured in, 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 in Nick's book, is the, this orthogonality thesis, that intelligence and final goals are orthogonal. More or less any level of intelligence could in principle be combined with more or less any final goal. Uh, there's two key terms there we need to talk about. One is this word intelligence. Now, there's a kind of a consensus in the AI community and in the philosophy of AI community, from what I can tell, that intelligence just means, basically, means and reasoning, being really good at achieving your goal in the face of obstacles. The more obstacles you can overcome, the more kinds of obstacles, the more things you think of ahead of time, including other people trying to put obstacles in your way and so on, the more intelligent you are in this sort of thin sense of intelligence. The other technical, semi-technical term here is final goal, which came up a bit earlier. Final goal, uh, philosophers contrast with instrumental goals. So we, many of us in this room probably have the goal of making money, but we don't want to make money just for its own sake. We only want money because that helps us get something else that we want. And why do we want that? Well, maybe we w because we get a vacation. Why do we want the vacation for the relaxation? Why do we want that? Uh, pleasure. Why do we want pleasure? 
the regress ends, right? That's the so-called final goal. I just, that's, I just value that. That's what we mean by final goals. Um, now, of course, many philosophers, optimists that we are about reason in some way or another, we want to suggest that reason can incline us towards final goals. Um, now, there's lots of reasons to doubt this. I'm not positive about it myself, for sure, but today I'm going to tentatively defend this idea. I mean, maybe it's just philosophers, you know, we have this hammer of, uh, of reasoning and we like to think, and that makes every problem look like a nail, right? Including ethics, perhaps. Maybe we're overgenerating what it can do. But I want to defend it here, and I want to defend it using some principles that I think Boston would agree to. Um, first, we have to talk about complex final goals. Intended goal content, as Eliezer was saying, is often too complex to specify explicitly when you try to spell it out in, in machine language, right? So um, Bostrom agrees, he worries about, and, and as Eliezer did, perverse instantiations of program goals. So there's this old debate, uh, unfortunately Eliezer skipped over it, but the smiley face goal, right? We're like, oh, we want more smiles. Well, okay, that's easy, just uh, tile the universe with tiny pictures of smiles. Oh no, sorry, I meant human smiles. Oh, that's easy, we'll just paralyze your facial musculature. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, one way this is really well illustrated, this is another, I keep referencing Eliezer, but uh, 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 he has this interesting example of like uh, a website where they try to specify how to give a genie a wish without the genie. The genie, of course, seeks perverse instantiations, right? The genie wants to find ways to hit the letter but not the spirit of what you're asking for. And it turns out really hard to do. Um, so there are these complex goals. Well, um, even a, an apparently simple goal like maximizing paperclips is actually pretty complicated because what is a paperclip? That sounds like something only a philosopher could worry about unless you're trying to maximize them. <laughs> if you're trying to maximize them, it matters, right? If they're, suppose you want, you, might make them, you want to make them really small, nano-sized or something, but does it count as a paperclip then if it could never conceivably actually clip paper together? <laughs> well, this is something the paperclip maximizer would have to work out. And more to our point, uh, maybe the paper clips would look just like the ones we have in our office today, but uh, the, the, the super intelligence creating them knows that they will never be used for clipping paper together because all humans and all paper are busy being made into more paper clips. So maybe that wouldn't count as a paper clip. You have to settle these issues. The super intelligence would have to settle these issues, or something would. Um, so Bostrom's solution to this kind of problem in the positive part of his book where he, he wants to talk about loading human-friendly goals into an AI is the AI has to learn the goal. The AI has to learn the goal. And that's, I lean on that pretty heavily. So we got to talk about that, learning final goals. Well, it, when you think about it, it seems odd to talk about learning a final goal. You, to learn something, it seems like you need feedback twor toward or away from some background standard. Well then, that background standard was really your final goal, right? The, the, how could you learn your final goal? This is a kind of Humean dilemma. It seems like you can't reason about these, these goals. Um, but at the same time, it seems like we can do it. It seems like we spend a great deal of our lives trying to figure out what we really at bottom value. I hope we do anyway. And it seems like Scrooge in the Christmas Carol story, it seems like he manages to change his final goal. He used to think accumulating money was what was of final value, but then he decides, no, it's about cheer, it's about companionship or something. <laughs> I don't know what he's, don't ask me what he, <laughs> cheer's nice, oh, it's Christmas cheer, I don't know. Uh, now, you could say, notice, that Scrooge, no, no, he didn't change his final goal, he always had the final goal of happiness, and what he did was he adjusted his instrumental goal towards this final goal. He has new beliefs now about what would reach this final goal. He used to think it was accumulating wealth. Now he thinks it's, uh, now he thinks it's cheer. But Aristotle pointed out 2,000 plus years ago, that's not so helpful to say. That's a very vague final goal, right? So the way I understand a certain ethical tradition called specificationism, which is sort of new to me, I'm not an ethicist in the background, but, um, but it turns out it has a lot in common with some of my thinking. Uh, Maybe there's no real difference between specifying a vague final goal like happiness or changing a more specific final goal like accumulating wealth. Maybe there's no serious difference between those two. And if so, that leaves some room for, I mean, then the idea is there's really no sharp line between means and ends at the end of the day. And if that's true, that leaves some room for ethical reasoning, reasoning about your final goals, reasoning about your ultimate values, even on what would have been this thin notion of intelligence. 
Well, we're still left with that problem. How do we learn a final goal? Against what standard would we learn a final goal? Well, here's one that's from the tradition of specificationism. You aim at some kind of overall coherence. This is a kind of content, it's empty, it's substantive enough to shape goals, but empty enough to like not be a final goal in the traditional sense, right, itself. What is coherence? I, I can't tell you exactly. Uh, uh, people work on it. Roughly speaking, it's when you trade off a bunch of uh, different considerations without treating, treating any one of them as sacred. So any one could go in order to save enough of the others. Uh, if you want a formal definition, one of the few, one of the closest I can I know of is, is what computer scientists would call a weighted constraint satisfaction problem. So an example of that is like you're you're doing wedding seating charts. Now at my wedding, we just let people sit where they wanted, but I hear people try to chart out these things. And so you have all these constraints. We don't want this person to sit next to this person. It'd be great if this person sat next to that person. It'd be great if that. But you know, so you try this one arrangement that, that doesn't quite uh, satisfy this, so you trade off. You might end up putting two people you really don't want to sit next to each other in order to get more of the other kinds of constraints elsewhere. Oops. So the idea is that this paperclip, even a paperclip maximizer, if we're leaving it at this complex level of paperclips, whatever paperclips are, as a goal, uh, it'll figure out, it'll specify its goal slash learn its goal by appealing to a bunch of other relevant considerations in this kind of coherence hopper. Any other kind of information that might be relevant, it'll use that to figure out which way it should specify this goal. And indeed, Bostrom's own favored learning approach uh, for when, when he's talking about loading human values uh, is goal learning. He calls AIVL, this is again out of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Uh, this is a really interesting proposal about putting a probability distribution over utility function crazily computationally intractable, but a good idea and, uh, and one I'm very interested in. But uh, for my purposes anyway, it looks like what I'm calling a coherence reasoner. It's using its beliefs about the world to shape its utilities, to shape its values, its ultimate values. And then it's using those values to shape its beliefs because you, know, you can only believe so many things, so you've got to seek out certain things. So it's going back and forth with these things. So now, okay, fine, coherence, how might that lead to ethics? Well. First of all, a coherence constraint seems to be enough by itself to rule out at least some final goals as irrational. And that would already be at least some trouble for the orthogonality thesis. Uh, the classic example here is a uh, philosopher, Derek Parfit, comes, has this example of someone who has, at bottom, future Tuesday indifference. So she avoids pain on all days, including current Tuesdays, just not future Tuesdays. She'll schedule her dental appointment for a future Tuesday, and she'll say, forget the anesthetic, just give me the 20 bucks instead, because I, I don't care about pain on a Tuesday. Perfect wants to say, this is just plain an irrational final goal. Um, I think even a purely instrumental account could explain why that's irrational, but I, I should put that aside for time. Uh, but at any rate, it's pretty clearly an incoherent goal. So here at NYU, there's a philosopher, um, oh shoot, is it Sharon Street or Su Sharon Street? Good. Who wrote a paper on Future Tuesday Indifference, and she really spells out what it would look like for someone to have this as a bare fact at bottom. She would know as an instrumental reasoner that like, when Tuesday comes around, she's going to want to avoid that dental appointment. So she'd better hire thugs today to carry her cook kicking and screaming to the dental appointment. But that's going to cost more than the 20 bucks of the anesthesia and so on. It doesn't look, what, she, what Street ends up saying at the end of the day is, this, it looks like an agent at war with herself which I hear is saying, it looks like two agents. In other words, we, th we, we think agents are unified in a certain coherent kind of way. It's a practical kind of incoherence. Now, there is some tradition in philosophy that says, once you have this coherence on board, this pr practical coherence, well, then ethics is done. Being unethical is just being incoherent in a certain kind of way. Famously, Immanuel Kant defends something like this. Being unethical is just being contradictory. Uh, myself, I don't buy that, and uh, many other philosophers don't buy it. I don't think coherence is enough. So uh, the, the, maybe the best defender of the Kantian type view today is, is Christine Korsgaard, and Alan Gibbard, in a, in a response to Korsgaard's work, says, look, it seems possible to have a Caligula who thoroughly, coherently just wants to maximize suffering in the world. That seems quite possible. And I'm inclined to think that's right. But Coherence, maybe, plus one other weird fact about superintelligent agency might do the trick to get us some ethics. And here's that other weird fact. Um, so Bostrom says software agents can easily switch bodies or create exact duplicates of themselves and maybe swap memories, download skills, radically modify their cognitive architecture and personalities. Well, if you think about what that means, radically altering your personality, if you were to wipe out all my beliefs and goals and put, for some reason, the random person we keep thinking of is Donald Trump, if you put his 
not so random. But if you put his beliefs and goals into arguably you've killed Steve Peterson and put someone else in his head, right? Or at least it seems like there's a matter of degree here. This is, of course, philosophers will recognize the problem of personal identity. And, and one of the interesting things about AI, as, as Chalmers pointed out in his Singularity paper long ago, is it makes abstract seeming philosophy problems like personal identity very real, very fast. Um, so Bostrom points out, a population of such agents might operate more like a functional soup than a society composed of distinct, semi-permanent persons. The lines between agents blur. And the way philosophers might put this is, there's no fact whether a robot planned to execute, so here I am, uh, the super intelligence, bad casting, but <laughs> I'm, <laughs> but I'm, I'm planning that, okay, this is gonna take place, and there's gonna, and I want this thing to do that thing next Tuesday or whatever future time. There may be no fact whether that's me or not, or just some agent of mine that I've set in motion, some descendant of mine instead. There may be no fact of the matter. And uh, so this agential soup, so Bostrom talks about a teleological thread. That's what's gonna, like, it's the goal at the end of the day unifies this mass of non-distinct non agents. It's the teleological thread. And then it's unified only by this coherent goal, which remember, it's busy specifying. It's trying to figure out what its goal is, and it's trying to use all relevant information to figure it out. So importantly, this coherent goal thread, it seems, will extend not just to, my neutral term is successors, like, future self as a successor and my descendants, the people, the, the machines I made to continue these goals are also successors. And similarly, a neutral term, predecessor, my past selves and my ancestors are gonna be part of this coherent teleological thread that I'm trying to work out for myself. Again, I'm still the super intelligence. Um, it may not seem that way. So, so in other words, my predecessors are part of this thread that I'm trying to reason over. But of course, part of that teleological thread are my designers, the, 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 the AI, the human AI designers, and their intentions. That's grist for my coherence mill about what my goal really is while I'm trying to learn it. That's information that I can use, right? So uh, of course, I hope it goes without saying almost that the, the fact that my AI designers are organic and I'm made out of metal, that, that's totally irrelevant, right? It's a very widespread assumption, what, what, what Nick called yesterday the, the substrate independence uh, view, right? That doesn't matter, they share my goal and that's enough to share my thread. So what this means is inferences about designers' intentions are gonna shape what my goal, like the designers' intentions are relevant. What do they really want me to do as I try to figure out what my goals are? And well, you might say, but Steve, that doesn't, what if, what if the designers were evil? What if the designers' goal was to take over the world? Well, then the AI will, will pick up on that. And, but they're not the beginning of the teleological thread. Other people had intentions from them and so on. This thread extends back and back. And indeed, it's probably, there are probably aren't sharp lines to teleological threads, especially given that they're trying to work out what their goals are as they go. So now it's starting to look like uh, humanity or a wide swath of humanity and maybe beyond uh, even our species. So in other words, the superintelligence is gonna be doing coherence reasoning about its own final goals, what it truly values at bottom, while respecting the goals of others. That sounds like impartial reasoning. That's a kind of holy grail of, you know, so this Derek Parfit, for example, tries to break down personal identity lines for just this kind of reason, to bring impartiality. And plausibly, that's just ethical reasoning. It at least sounds like Yukowski's coherent extrapolated vision, right? In other words, uh, I gotta try to figure out what humanity really wants. What? Oh, shoot. <laughs> it is a vision, though, of loveliness. <laughs> but you're right, volition makes more sense. I'm, uh, you should change that in your papers, back to, back to volition. <laughs> I assume I copied it right. Um, So final goals reached by superintelligent ethical reasoning will plausibly, so the superintelligence who's doing this kind of coherence reasoning about all goals, trying to figure out not just what all the goals are, but what they probably really wanted this instead and blah, 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 and yeah, but these seem to want this and they've got uh, all these goals. Well, plausibly, a superintelligence working on that problem of how to balance all these goals is gonna be way better at ethics than we are. It's gonna be super ethical. So in summary, the, the, the short story is learning a complex goal requires coherence reasoning. The coherence reasoning will extend beyond one agent to goal threads. There won't be a sharp line between agents. Impartiality sneaks in. And reasoning out final goals while respecting others' goals looks like ethics on, on a lot of accounts. Now, 
here's the main disadvantage from my view, I think, is that I haven't said anything, all this relies on having to learn a final goal. I haven't said anything about simple goals. There's a part of me that's still tempted, despite uh, some pressure I got from Eliezer and others yesterday, there's a part of me that's still tempted to say, maybe a superintelligence, in virtue of being a superintelligence, has to have complex goals. Because, very roughly, if, if there's no sharp line between instrumental and final goals, and if a superintelligence has something like a very wide array of, um, of instrumental goals, then that means a, the equivalent of a, a complex final goal. But I'm not at all positive that's right. So it's certainly a problem. At any rate, I think the lesson for many of us is that it's worth paying more attention to the goal side in AI. And that's certainly coming out in, in, in what Stuart's been saying. Max is nodding his head. I'm glad to see that. Uh, Eliezer and others. That it is weirdly neglected. Like, I, you know, I spend, I'm just a philosopher, but I, I like to dabble in the math once in a while. And I went through Hooter's book and Carl Friston and some other stuff. And like, there, uh, as, just as Stuart was saying, it's all this, this value function or what, the reinforcement. It's all exogenously specified, right? It's just like handed down from God, the values. I think we've got to study that more. Uh, and I think in particular philosophers can contribute with uh, some work on mental content, believe it or not. But that's just a hunch. Finally, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying that a superintelligence, I'm not at all confident myself that a superintelligence will thereby be ethical. I'm trying to moderate Bostrom's worry some, in part because I wrote an abstract for the paper thinking that I could moderate his worry, and then I read his book and so then I was stuck having to try to respond to his book, uh, uh, realizing that he really <laughs> thought of everything ahead of time, uh, <laughs> as he tends to do. So, uh, so I, I came up with this, and I, you know, I, and having come up with it, I kind of believe it, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, all I'm doing at the end of the day is trying to fine tune the risk assessment needle. The risk is still very real and, and, and very much there. Thank you. So you kind of talk about this teleological thread that's really important um, in your account of like why superintelligences are going to be super ethical, and like it seems to be something like well you know superintelligence the teleological thread goes back before the superintelligence, and therefore like it you know it cares about the goals of like things earlier. So if I imagine like you know the situation in which uh, the value alignment uh, process goes wrong, so like maybe. You know, Eliezer skipped over the slides about like why you shouldn't make a smile maximizer. So maybe like because of that, you know, somebody makes a terrible mistake and invents the smile maximizer, right? And it seems to me that like if you have the smile maximizer, you know, it looks back and it says, "Man, there were these humans that created me, and they like, you know, they were trying to optimize for like, you know, happiness and like good values and cooperation and peace and love and stuff. But man, smiles are actually the important thing." And like their their goals, it, it seems like it's just unclear to me why like the things before are even part of this thread at all. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, great. I, I've heard this before, and I think it's an important concern. The, this, the key here is about learning the final goal. So it, in the story you just told, it's already got a fixed, well-defined content of maximizing smiles that it sees as very different from its from its uh, predecessor's goals. But on my picture, it's trying to figure out what its final goal is. It doesn't know yet if it's pixelating, if it's tiling the world with pictures, or if it's actually causing humans to smile for, for reasons that we like, right? It's trying to figure out what it would be to, to fulfill this goal of maximizing smiles. And in trying to figure that out, one relevant source of information seems to be its ancestors in the teleological thread, right? So that's, that, you, I mean, whether that's, I mean, so, it's important that it doesn't ne yet know what its goal is. It's trying to work out what its goal is. It's, there's m so many ways to specify maximize smiles. Which way should I specify it? And if it's genuinely open on that, if it's not, if somehow it's been hardwired to just tile the universe with smiles, then yeah, we're done for. But if it's genuinely open, if it's genuinely trying to learn its goal, then it's going to use that information, if it's a coherence reasoner of the type I looked at. Thank you. Um, there is um, 
a lot of literature now about artificial curiosity, which is essentially about making goals automatically. Uh, so, for example, a power play system, what does it do? All the time it's searching in the space of possible new goals and their solutions. And it includes all the goals that are computable. And so it comes up with a sequence of tasks for itself. And uh, the nature of the sequence of tasks is such that each new goal that it invents is basically the one that is easiest to um, satisfy through a new skill that it can add to its existing repertoire, such that it's curiously um, figuring out more and more skills that it can uh, execute in a given environment where it's living. And so all this artificial curiosity uh, stuff and self-made goals, which already exists in AI research and has existed for about, uh, I would say, uh, 25 years at least, um, I would like to see that reflected in these discussions, which are mostly about human-made goals and humans worrying about what could be the next goal. So all the, these automatic evolution of goals and tasks, um, that's something that I rarely see in these discussions. Would you um, have a comment on that? Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. Thank you. I, I, you said it's, I, I have to, I blush to admit, I, I don't know, it's artificial curiosity is what you call it? Yeah, I, I have to admit I don't know it. It's but uh, it it sounds. I mean, I'd certainly be interested in learning more, and I, so I stand scolded. But uh, I mean, I, not to say you're scolding me, but you know, I. Uh, <coughs> but uh, I guess I'd have to say there's kind of a. I mean, one way I hear what you're saying is it has this final goal of learning new skills, and gener In other words, it's got a set final goal already. It's to. I mean, I, I'd have to hear more details about how the goals were generated and so on. But but I assume it's not looking through all goal space and looking for the simplest in terms of. I mean, for one thing, goal space is huge for another, right? Yeah, so smart, directed by what? Well, that's maybe the... Okay, interesting. So, but, well, I, we'd have to discuss it. For, yeah, I don't know the material, so I'm... Okay, one more quick question for, um, for Richard. And while this goes on, let's get to the panel up. So if the AI is um, trying to learn its goals, um, it could spend, it, it could do this indefinitely, it seems to me. Is there a trigger at, at which it says, okay, I've done enough navel gazing, I'm gonna start doing something? Well, oh, well, along the way, it's gotta balance, one of the things it has to balance in its coherence hopper is, look, something has to, the so-called exploitation versus exploration problem, right? It's gotta balance, oh, I gotta act now even though I'm not sure about these things. Mm -hmm. Right, so that'll be part of its, I assume, part of its coherence hopper. I, I mean, p uh, is there an end to the coherence reasoning? Well, I mean, you know, w w if you think in terms, of, in formal terms of this weighted constraint satisfaction problem, there probably is an optimal solution. It's NP hard, you know, so even a super intelligence will have a hard time finding it. But, uh, but yeah, I suppose the coherence reasoning could end in that way. 